Good. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Kane Stevens Super Show, the super show in all the land. I'm your super host, Kane Stevens. And if you could say that as many times as I can and not screw up, then uh, I'll give you $100 or something. So <laughs> super califragilistic, expiatodocious, all that stuff. Uh, I've got another super guest. I'm pumped about it. Um, I just met him on a, uh, you know, online. We started talking, you know, kind of gelled and everything. And, uh, you know, he just so happens to also be like a, like a hypnotist, a comedy hypnotist. And, uh, and, all, and so I thought this is going to be perfect for my audience. I and mean, we talked about ghosts, we talked mediums, we talked all this, but we haven't talked to a hypnotist yet. So we want Jesse to be our, uh, our link to the hypnotist world. So with that being said, let's give him a, a applause here. Let's have Jesse Lewis on the show. Everybody. Come on now. All right. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. Life is wonderful. I'm glad to be doing an interview on the Super Show, and it's going to be a blast. Let me tell you, we're going to go through a lot of stuff, and we'll get into the paranormal side if you want to. We'll get into the comedy side if you want to, and we'll get into the motivation side, too, if you want to. Let's let's get we'll into all of it. Um, first things first, let's get into where you're from. Uh, you're actually in uh, in Canada right now, correct? I am in Canada. I've been here for, well, since I was born, and yep. it's the greatest place <laughs> on earth. So we could say you're Canadian and we'd be, we'd have a fair assessment. Absolutely. What, so I, I like to uh, boringly ask people sometimes because I mean, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is in central United States. Uh, you know, what, what, what is the wet? The North scares the hell out of me because it's so damn cold up there and I, I should be in a tropical environment, but I'm not. What's the weather like up there today? Well, we run Celsius, so it's going to be weird for yeah. you because well, Americans are Fahrenheit, but we're sitting at, uh, well, we're probably at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there. We're almost freezing. It's it's warm outside for yeah, us. Is, uh, is that shorts weather for you guys? Um, is that shorts well, weather for you? Like, would you go out in a sh uh, jacket and shorts in 20-some degree weather? Uh, I'd probably go out in a bunny hug. Uh, oh, Americans. Um, in a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a hoodie. And, a uh, we call them bunny hugs. Right on. Well, well, it's all it's all right, man. You know, it's just like if I talk to a British person or something. You know, they you guys have you guys have your own lingo and everything. I think the misconception is all you guys say is a, and uh, you know, like a, and, and stuff like that. But I mean, I've talked to many Canadians. I've produced a Canadian podcast for somebody, and I mean, I, you guys actually have a pretty good uh, <laughs> pretty good lingo going on there, aside from just what Americans think you say. Well, it's the same thing for us looking at Americans, right? There's a lot of different uh, dialects and a whole bunch of things. And that falls into the hypnosis category as well, right? It's all about communication. Right. So understanding how to communicate with people, pretty important stuff. Well, let's let's dive into uh, to hypnosis. I mean, I'm sure my listeners are going to be dying to know. Um, I mean, what... I guess we can just start with first, like, how did you get into hypnosis? Like, how did you, how did you arrive on the idea? Like, this is what I want to do. Really weird story there, actually. I used to work for a hog farm, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense. Like you're in Nebraska, so you know what a hog farm is, right? 18,000 oh, yeah. pigs in a barn in the middle of nowhere. I used to uh, distribute fertilizer and I had okay. a crew under me of 21 guys and we weren't paying them very well and I wasn't getting paid very well. And I used to work about 400 hours a month. And when you work 400 hours a month, you get really, really stressed out really, really quickly. Yeah. How I dealt with that stress was I learned hypnosis and I used it to relieve my stress. And eventually I said, well, screw this thing. I'm, I'm going to actually go get a job doing hypnosis. I read a book and I went to 30 different bars. 29 of them said no. It was a book on comedy hypnosis, and one of them said yes, and I did my very first hypnosis show about a month after that, and from there, six months later, I quit that job that I had, and I became a full-time comedy hypnotist for the last, well, since 2007, so 15, 16 years almost. It's been Amazing a long Amazing what you can do when you just read some books and apply yourself, you know what I mean? Like, you can literally learn anything. It's just like going to a... You know, we're in a great age right now where we can go to YouTube University and we can have people who are who are leading experts in the field teaching us how to do all this stuff. Uh, you know, hence being a podcast producer and all this stuff. I mean, it's not like I woke up one day and I was like, I'm a podcast uh, podcaster. I'm a pod I had to like learn about it. You know, I'm not saying I'm 
Joe Rogan style good at it, but I'm saying, you know, I, I got it. We, we get it down to a science and it sounds like you had a podcast as well um, before. So have you been, have you been a guest and been doing, doing things in the past like this? I I did a, a hundred episodes of the Jesse Lewis show when COVID first hit. Yeah. And I was doing everybody from celebrities to, to, to just coaches, to mediums, a whole bunch of people got interviewed and I did a hundred episodes. And then unfortunately, because COVID hit, my life went to complete manure and uh, I quit that podcast, but it's still up somewhere on YouTube. I'm not sure. I don't even keep track of it anymore, yeah. but it was really actually pretty good. And uh, I've done radio and TV for a long, long time up here in Canada. So I've been all over the place. And well, uh, I mean, I, I really am thrilled to have you on, man. It's uh, like I said, we put this together fast, but I, I like to jump on the opportunity when I think a guest would be perfect. So for my listeners out there, for the audience, you know, uh, you guys should be showering me with gifts and all this. You know what I mean? Like I, here we are putting together a great show. You've got an, an amazing guest. I mean, this guy's been on TV. He's he's a podcast. I mean, he's a hypnotist. What more do you want from us? So um, let, let's dive more into uh, into hypnosis in general. So, I mean, um, most people have no idea. They think it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors, right? Just like talking to a medium. They would put a hypnosis sometimes in the same category as like a ghost hunter or. <laughs> so tell me tell me more about hypnosis, if you can elaborate. Okay, so the easiest way for me to describe hypnosis is that if you believe, nothing can deter you from that. But if you don't believe, nothing will make you believe in it. Um, the truth is there's been studies done. There's been people hooked up to machines and everything else. And there's absolutely nothing different in hypnosis than there is in a normal state. Nothing yeah. different. Technically... Technically, hypnosis can't be differentiated at all. However, the way I'm going to put it to you is really simple. It's a state where you're fully aware, but you just don't care. And that's it. So imagine you're driving down the highway and you just kind of fade out, right? You go on autopilot and just go through it and you get to your destination of what was going on it's not that you weren't aware of your surroundings or anything like that but you just didn't care and once you reach that point technically you're in hypnosis an example of this are you married by chance yes yes i am okay has we live in a, a different time so has your partner come up to you and just nee, 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 before and you All didn't even time. know it every day <laughs> now it's not because you don't love them. It's not because you don't care. It's because you were fully aware. You just didn't care about your surroundings at the time. And that TV had sucked you in to a trance-like state. Hypnosis is not trance, but it's a trance-like state where you're fully aware. You just don't care. And you focus on one thing. So technically, during that time while you were watching TV, you were technically hypnotized. It happens while we drive. It happens while we listen to music. It happens even right now as we speak. It could be happening if I use the appropriate words to put you in a state like that. Does that make sense? I don't think it would take much to put me down, man. You know, I, I, it, I almost have like narcolepsy at times. Like if I'm tired, my body has two switches. It's on or it's off. So I'll bet you, <laughs> I'll bet you could put me in a trance pretty quickly. So that does bring up another, a myth that, about hypnosis that isn't actually true that it's sleep. Okay. The thing is you're fully aware of everything going on. You yeah. just don't care. You really don't. And you basically fall on autopilot, provided they're not against your moral code. Uh, right. We'll get more into that as well. But generally, people don't actually have much of a moral code, which is what allows comedy hypnotists like me to get people to do weird things on stage. Yeah. If it was like an R-rated show or something like that. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a weird subject. And there's a lot of stuff to delve into there. Well, I think yeah, I, I think I uh, misnomer is that you know you put people to sleep. I guess what I'm getting at is I okay, like a guy like myself. I don't know if this would be a hindrance or not. I have an overactive mind, like a like a wrecking ball mind that just that it's always moving. There's always it's almost a curse, is what I tell people because sometimes I just want to chill. That's why I have the on and off switch. Once my mind 
has decided to just give in for a second, say uncle or whatever, then I'm just done. You know what I mean? Like I just fall asleep and I'm through. So that's kind of what it is. But is that a hindrance to you? Like uh, does a type of mind hinder the process? So the answer is yes and no. Um, an overactive mind. So the technical definition, I'll get to the technical definition. Yeah, the technical please. definition of hypnosis is the bypass of the critical factor and the establishment of acceptable selective thinking. Okay. okay. So if you overanalyze everything, it's actually a really good thing for hypnosis because while you're analyzing, I'm talking to your subconscious mind and allowing those suggestions just to fly right past the analytic part. It allows me to put a person like that into hypnosis very, very quickly, like literally done. And sometimes what you'll get is a person who is very analytical about what's going on and they just for lack of a better term, they fall asleep really quickly into the hypnotic state, um, even though it's not sleep. It's just a sleep-like thing. Right. And once you're past that analytic, analytic part or once that an analysis is happening and people are wondering, what is this? What is this? What is this? It it basically eliminates the critical factor, which is the part of you that tells you not to touch the stove. It's the part of you that tells you not to run around naked, that critical factor. It allows us to bypass that and have that establishment of acceptable selective thinking that's not against your moral code. Yeah. So really, yes, the answer to your question is yes, being analytical makes it easier to actually hypnotize somebody. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is, it, is it easier or harder? Because of being analytical, uh, which I am, especially like I do paranormal investigation and stuff too. And I think I'm the biggest, uh, for lack of a better term, boner killer to the whole group, because when something happens, as much as I believe, and I'm a massive believer, I'm always, I'm always like instantly looking for, oh, it was this, it was that, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm always coming up with, or, or trying to come up with a solution for it, not because I want to shoot it down, but because I want to, I, I just, I'm trying to come up with answers like everybody else, or otherwise, what's the point, Right. Um, so, so it sounds to me like it'd probably be easier to put a guy like me down, uh, not to sleep, but uh, under, I should say, under is a better term, yes. right? Yes, um, that's a much better term. And so you do, uh, you also, you do comedy shows and you do like, uh, you like, you do, you do uh, like big rooms of people and then, you know, people are selected type stuff. Like, uh, walk me through that process. So, yeah, I do, I do comedy hypnosis shows. That's my primary income. It's really all I did for pretty much 13 years yeah. and uh, that along with a bit of hypnotherapy as well. But how it works is basically I go, somebody hires me for like a corporate event or a school event or basically any event with over 50 people. That's generally the, the sweet spot. And I make a speech about hypnosis, basically what I've talked to you about that you're not going to do anything against your morals, what hypnosis is, what they're going to do up on stage. And they're just going to be a lot of fun. And I bring people up, usually anywhere between 10 and 40. It can be pretty big sometimes. And I put them through a process of hypnosis. I keep anywhere from 25% to 80%, depending on the group. Uh, there's always those that don't go into hypnosis. And you send them back in the audience, and they have fun out there. And it's not because they can't go into hypnosis, because they choose not to go into hypnosis at the time. And basically, we put them in hypnosis. We do some stupid stuff. Some weird things go on at some shows, and we'll talk about that as well. One, a couple of the stories I have. Yeah, please do. And uh, yeah, I I take them through the process of the comedy, and it's a blast. I, I get them doing everything from having a drag race with a unicorn to flying in space to sniffing magic unicorn powder, and uh, just making them feel good and motivational and and having a good time. It's so uh, much more it's than what people dog. would assume is like, uh, you make some, make, you make them bark like a dog and uh, squawk like a chicken and stuff. You're doing way, you're, you're doing it above the, all that. Although you're not yeah. above that, right? You would do that too, wouldn't you? It's funny. I, I have. Um, the, the, the thing about that is it became a stigma, just like the old swinging watch thing. It became a stigma yeah. of hypnosis. That's what people think. You put a top hat on and, and you got, yeah. you're getting sleepy. Well, that movie came out for, in the 1930s. It was about Spengali, and it, it was about a, a hypnotist getting somebody to rob a bank and kill people. That's yeah. not how it works. You're never going to do anything against your morals as long as you have morals. So 
one of the things I like to say is during the show, you're never going to do anything against your moral code. But the problem is most people don't have a moral code and we really don't. Right. If, right. if you knew you could get away with it and that you could blame me, you would probably run outside naked, waving your thing around. If you knew you could get away with it and nobody <laughs> would care because you were blaming me for it. And that's really how hypnosis works is it allows you, the volunteer or whoever the volunteer is to blame the hypnotist and say it was the hypnotist's fault. And that's right. why I did it. And it's really nice. Um, just a story about something weird. I want to tell you about something weird that happened in one of my hypnosis shows out in Manitoba, up here in Canada. I was at a Legion Hall and I had hypnotized four people in, in the Legion. It was for a Halloween performance. And at the end of the show, I do a dreams coming true skit. And basically it allows people to, to live out their dreams and to follow those dreams if they choose to. And during this skit, I had a man have a reaction because he had imagined whether real or fake, he thought this happened to him. He had imagined that the clouds had parted. I didn't give him any of these suggestions, but the clouds had parted in his mind and he was able to talk to his mother. Wow. And he talked to his mother and he told me that he went through an entire lifetime in the duration of that skit about everything bad that happened, about everything good that happened. And when that skit lasts three minutes, but in his imagination, he had taken that entire lifetime and he had reconciled with his mother who had been dead for about 15 years. He was bawling, crying. And I still keep in contact with him. And he still tells me to this day that it was one of the most life-changing events that he's ever experienced in his life. Now, you talk about paranormal stuff. Mm -hmm. I fully agree that there's a paranormal aspect to it. This may have been an auto suggestion from him, which does happen in hypnosis. Sometimes there's an automatic healing suggestion. Or the other possibility is that whatever is on the other side, if there is anything on the other side, opened up and gave this man a message specifically so he could move on with his life and have some closure. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in hypnosis. It, it gives me chills, man. I, I got like goosebumps just listening to that story because it's like, it uh it's so amazing like like you you did something there you healed the guy without even trying to heal the guy you know what i mean and i i think what you said was very uh very profound was that what i mean if we do believe in ghosts okay if we do believe in spirits whatever you believe in what if what if one of them you know what if his mom did come through what if what if they did reconcile through that that form you know if they came through and that way of communicating they they had him in the right state I mean that that's amazing, man. I mean that I I could see that like being a, a life altering uh, thing. Like I wish there were certain people in my life who would come to me. I've been to mediums. Uh, they've they've said things to me that really were profound to me. But I I could definitely see that. Uh, you know, I I might get teared up right now just uh, just off the story you told me, man. That's wild. But um, so you have stuff like that going going on. But what keeps you from being a uh, maniacal uh, villain in all this stuff? I mean, it, which is your moral code good enough where you're not going to end up being, uh, you know, Batman's next uh, arch enemy? So you really want the honest truth? This is a weird one. I read. Uh, oh, I used to read a lot, and my moral code is is based on two things. Uh, number one is the Forgotten Realms fantasy series. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard about, it, but it's basically Dungeons and Dragons. And the second thing it's based on is Star Trek, okay. specifically the Next Generation. So, yes. so, so it sounds really weird, but I always feel that you should treat each, you live by the golden rule. You tr treat each other as you wish to be treated, basically, right? So for me, I've got currently seven children under my my fatherly structure okay? okay so i never want to treat the people in my audience or the volunteers that come up any way other than how i would treat my kids yeah. i don't want them getting naked i don't want them being embarrassed i don't want them doing stupid stupid things i want them to feel good after the show which is why i do a motivational comedy hypnosis show and i want them to understand that they were the show it's nothing to do with me it's them. they made the show so yeah. that's what keeps me from doing weird things. Funny you should mention that, and we should get into this, actually. There's a lot of uses for hypnosis that are covert, 
that you don't even know are happening. For instance, um, certain politicians speak in a very specific way, which is hypnotic in nature. They'll okay. stop in very specific spots. They'll use specific words. They'll repeat specific words. And it's not just politicians. It's everybody from churches to politicians to just advertisements on TV is everywhere and how people use these hypnotic methods these neuro-linguistic programming methods to manipulate the general public so yeah that's a whole other topic though it is it's a lo it's a loaded topic and question on purpose um i love that you you uh <laughs> i love that you mentioned uh star trek the next generation i think that it's that you know i'm a huge trekkie but it's specifically i'm a huge next generation fan because it hit me at the right time as a kid and jean Luc picard is such a you know captivating person and captain and it's just like it really is inspiring but you know i, w I was talking to a, a guy who does like creature feature stuff not too long ago uh dr sanguinary and yeah. uh and he's also a big trekkie uh, more so than like horror movies and stuff honestly he he seemed like he didn't even care about horror movies which is funny because that's what they play but he is into uh you know uh star trek when i was telling him my wife uh when she comes home from lunch i'm i usually have star trek the next generation on and i was about to dial up those papers you know like i was about to hit the divorce button because she told me that it was the cheesiest thing she'd ever seen and i'm like uh, i'm like i'm like dialed in you know like on what's happening i mean they're you know, they got the Borg, the Borg stuff happening and, you know, everything with data is going down. And I'm like, how can you call I mean, how can you call this cheesy? It's science fiction. But uh, it, it's just such an amazing show. So, I mean, who is your favorite character? If I have to ask, is it Jean-Luc? Is it who is it? It, it has to be. It, it's yeah. always Jean-Luc. Um, simply because he was the leader and he, they did follow his moral compass. Yeah. And you could say it was the Federation's moral compass, but I disagree with that. Um, and the, on top of that, he did have faults. It wasn't just... He wasn't one-sided as a captain. He had actual faults. He made mistakes, but he was also responsible for himself. And he had a specific honor code that he followed um, that was really important for me as a kid. Uh, yeah. Yeah, th that's basically it. I... I he I think that there needs to be more of that in this world where we're inclusive and we follow an honor code. It really is that simple. I miss those type of shows where you, I mean, like us as kids, we, we learned a lot of our morals from TV. Like I don't take it. I don't take that away from experts when experts, excuse me, when they say that TV and music and all that stuff can influence you. I mean, it, it absolutely can. I don't necessarily buy into the fact that, all of this stuff makes somebody go and shoot a place up and all that stuff. I think, I think there's so many variables in there. That's ridiculous to, you know, blame that one thing, you know, like say if you listen to Marilyn Manson or whatever here in the United States, well, there's a lot of shootings here. Right. Um, yep. I, I don't know why. I don't know what our culture, I don't know if we have a bloodlust culture here, you know, it's similar to like the Roman gladiators I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, the, I certainly, we don't have to get into politics of things because I, I hate talking politics, mm -hmm. but I will say this is TV. I, I miss those days, man. Like yeah, there was on Star Trek. There's, there's a moral code. You knew where Jean-Luc stood. You knew where the crew stood and everything, yep. you know, they, they were humanitarians. They wanted to help. I, I, I was wrong term because they're aliens. Right. But you get what I mean. Uh, <laughs> they they yes. were for the creatures and everything. My favorite, if I had to choose, Honestly, I just I've always dug data. So data was my favorite out of that. Like I, I just thought data was uh, watching his growth and seeing like how he wanted emotion, you know, and he longed to be he was around all these people and like seeing the journey and how important data was to the show. I would say data for me, but John Luke, of course, after that. So Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's our nerd talk for the time, right? <laughs> well, it works. Second favorite character was Riker because he got the ladies, of course. But he, he but, was he was he was like a Tom Selleck, uh, you know. He was like what he had the beautifully sculpted beard, you know, perfect hair. I mean, Riker was was like he was the man, yeah. And he always had the ladies kind of reeled in. Then when he got, you know, he, then you know he got married to the hottest one in the show, right? So it's like, 
Absolutely. <laughs> Kudos to him. If you watch the old ones, it's crazy because like all of the alien alien women and everything, they're all hot. Like it, it's ridiculous. Like they were de definitely doing the sex sales thing with the first, uh, you know, the first iteration of Star Trek. That was the time period, though. I think I think it goes right along with. So we live in a very different world than then, right? So yeah. there was black exploitation going on. There was there was sexualization of women going on. All that stuff, right? right. So, yeah, it was a very different time. And I basically, if you were a minority, you either had to be super hot or you got put into different areas uh, in shows. Right? The, right? There wasn't a lot of minority representation. Although Star Trek was one of the first that really did have that representation, which was really important. So yeah, yeah. So, um, so we're, co we're covering, we're covering some of this. We're kind of diving into what you do. Um, you, you do the comedy side. Cause I, I mean, you seem like you're probably a pretty funny guy too. It, it's nice to mix it in there. There was a, there was a famous, um, a famous one to our area. I don't know if you ever knew him. Maybe you guys go to like a convention. Did you ever know Jay medicine hat? Did you ever meet him from, uh, from I've never the heard of States? Him, no. Yeah, he was he was like a Native American guy, big old guy. Uh, he was on like a, one of the major local like uh, radio stations here, but he was also like uh, like known throughout the country, and everything. And he was a comedy hypnotist, and so um, he would do like X rated shows and different things. So, do you do R and X rated shows? I think you mentioned that. And if you do, how wild do those get? So I've I actually don't. Um, my main okay. audience is corporate corporate clients. Yeah, so yeah. So you can't get too wild. HR company. Yeah. So I keep it super clean, and there's a reason for that. I could go work in a bar for like three hundred dollars and do an X rated show, right? Or I can work for corporate clients for, I'm not going to say. Yeah. Uh, dot dot and dot. Do a really clean show. Yeah. And uh, and make a better living having to perform less. That, that's that's just that's just simple business at the end of the day. That's yeah. smart. It's just like, yeah. uh, you know, it's just like if, if I were on a local radio, I could be, I could try to be super filthy, right? But they would kick me off for that. Yeah. So why not, why not be smart and use those minds of ours and come up with another word that would, uh, that would suffice. You know what I mean? Like, imagine that, right? Like open those, uh, open those dictionaries and thesauruses and all this stuff and actually have like other words to say. <laughs> On top of that, I find that uh, the X-rated skits can get yeah. transformed into something else. I'll give you an example of this. There is an old skit where you get them imagining they're watching a movie, mm -hmm. and and then they're imagine it's a romantic movie and they have their first kiss, and then that first kiss turns into the next step, and you can get really really dirty with that. Or you can say, well, that next step, you realize it's your parents. Yeah. And it's not dirty for the entire audience. It's only dirty for that specific volunteer because they're imagining their parents are in that movie doing dirty things for five seconds. And right. the movie changes to something else. Um, another one is something like the giving birth skit. Instead of giving birth, so what you do is you get the males in the audience to or male volunteers to imagine they're about to give birth. They go through the pregnancy process. They go through all the scientific things. Their their boobs grow. They milk. Blah blah blah. All that stuff. And that's actually clean because it's taught in eighth grade. Uh, um, actually fifth grade. And then instead of giving birth to a person, they give birth to an egg, or they lay an Easter egg, or something like that, um, because that's where the potential hazards come in when it comes to describing that type of thing if that makes sense so well, and it, it's funny it, it's and you're really also you're also being funny to a broad audience you know like a you like especially corporate you could you could have some stuffy people in the crowd you could have all sorts of stuff like that so it sounds yeah. like you're uh you're good at adapting you're you're doing the appeal thing i'm still convinced that maybe you are a a, a, a maniacal superhero uh evil villain character but you never know <laughs> well a lot of people look at you guys as like uh, just above um magicians i like i don't know why you guys get that but because really there's a there's a lot of uh there's a lot of thought that goes into what you're doing and there's a lot of sight and you have to be a i think okay maybe i'm wrong as a dumb person i guess um there, there dumb, seems that you would have to be a pretty smart person to do this stuff you know to to keep your moral code going 
and everything. So I, I think that there's a there's a lot going on be, by being a hypnotist. There is. Um, the the easiest answer to that is I think that a generalized hypnotist is a smart person who I'm going to use the wrong words, but they understand how to manipulate certain things. They just choose to use it in a very wise way and are generally not maniacal, crazy, evil people. Generally, right. there's a few out there that I won't deal with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's like any segment of the population, right? You've got doctors that do bad stuff, you've got coaches that do bad stuff, you've got priests that do bad stuff. And as far as a numbers game goes, eventually there's going to be a hypnotist that does something really, really bad. It's, it's just what happens. Um, we've been very lucky because we're a very self-regulated industry, I guess. Mm -hmm. And generally the people who are teaching are teaching the newer hypnotists that if you are going to do an X-rated show, that you either use a different name or something like that. Um, or if you're going to do that X-rated show, I've actually had an idea for quite a while about doing an X-ray show under the masked hypnotist. And I've really thought about doing that. However, I still don't want anybody to do stuff that I wouldn't have my kids do on stage. It's yeah. just me personally. So I've, I've actually shelved that for 15 years and just not done anything with it. So any hypnotist that's listening, the masked hypnotist is open and you could probably make a good fortune doing it and branding it. Well, you know, I, uh, Sorry for going off on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, that's not a tangent at all. I, that's good stuff. And it, it's, it's good for people to hear. And I mean, I don't know if there's any hypnotists in there or want to be hypnotists in the audience here, but it is good to hear from people like yourself um, and, and kind of point them in the right direction. I mean, maybe, maybe they are planning to do, uh, do this or that. Maybe they want to shoot for the corporate audience or whatever, you know, uh, whatever their goals are you're kind of, you're kind of telling them like, you know, maybe, maybe you need to try to like, keep it clean a little bit. Like, I think that's great advice. Do a show as if you're doing it with your kids, you know, but, but you can be funny. You're still adults, right? You can be funny. Mm -hmm. that, that's another one of those intelligence things. You can be funny without being foul. I mean, there's lots of comedians who do it. However, a lot of us tend to gravitate and we like the foul because it's almost the shock of it all but you're you know i think for you the shocking enough is that hey this guy's hypnotizing people and wild things are happening yeah but the, the thing about being foul is you can go to the edge but you don't go over the edge yeah. for instance you, you can you can one of the skits that i do in my show is they've just eaten and it starts to give them gas and now the edge of that is they get gas, they they smell the other people's farts, they smell the audience's farts, they smell their own farts. Now, the edge of that is if I made them shit their pants. Right. Okay? I don't do that. Sorry for swearing. But that's the edge. No, you're and good. in a few moments, you're going to imagine that you yourself fart, but it's completely silent. One, two, three. And, and they imagine they fart. The edge that I go to is in a few moments, you're going to realize it was just a little bit more than a fart. Now, I'm not actually saying that they pooped their pants, but you're going to imagine that it's just a little bit more than a fart on the count of three. One, two, three. And they imagine it and you got to wiggle it out. There's only one way to get rid of it. And they go, they wiggle in their chairs. And that toes the very line. And I've talked to HR pros about this. It toes the very line between me saying that they crap themselves and me not saying that they crap themselves. But the right. audience extrapolates from that that they have. And it gets reactions like you wouldn't believe. And then one, two, three, sleep down, and they go back down. Um, and yeah, it, it's keeping it clean to a point and not crossing that line that's really important. Yeah. Well, man, I just have so many. You just hit, uh, well, for me, far, me and my family, uh, farts are funny, right? Uh, <laughs> you get extra points if you shart yourself. Uh, you get all that. But in an HR scenario, you know, um, I could see where it could be a, a tough thing because it's like, what if Bob crapped his pants at the show? And then everybody's like, oh, now we're going to make fun of Bob. And then they start bullying Bob, you know. So it could be a rough type of deal. But let's pick up on this. Uh, I do have to give us a pause here for a moment. I do have some awesome uh, sponsors on my hand. Uh, so I don't know if you have tattoos or not. Um, 
But if you do, uh, you know, we here in the Lincoln area, we have Sly Ink Tattoo is one of our sponsors. So uh, we have Sly Ink and we also have uh, the Elegant Sasquatch. So I see you have a beard. Uh, he's got awesome beard, beard balms. Uh, you'll no longer have that egg smell in your beard any longer. So um, with that being said, we will come back from our brief intermission shortly after a word from our sponsor. Hey there, fellow follicle enthusiasts. We have a sponsor that's about to make your beards go wild with delight. Brace yourselves for the one and only the elegant Sasquatch. Are you ready to unleash your outer beast? Dane, I've been waiting for this moment my entire bearded life. But tell me, how can the elegant Sasquatch help us awaken our inner beasts? Oh, my hairy companion, the elegant Sasquatch has a treasure trove of beard products that will have your whiskers partying like it's the wildest night in the forest. From their aromatic beard oils to their beastly balms and buttery concoctions, they've got everything you need to make your beard sing with joy. I can almost hear my beard belting out its own rendition of I Will Survive. <laughs> Your beard is in for a treat, my friend, and here's the best part. Every single product is handmade with love. Picture this, a team of Sasquatch artisans rocking their aprons and wielding their grooming tools, crafting beard goodies that will blow your mind. It's like a hairy fiesta of craftsmanship. I can see those Sasquatch artists dancing with their combs and trimmers like they're on a hairy stage. Absolutely. These bearded maestros pour their heart and soul in every bottle of beard oil, every tin of balm, and every tub of butter. They're like the Michelin-starred chefs of the beard world, creating culinary delights for your facial hair. My beard is salivating in anticipation. Well, get ready for your beard to do a happy dance because the elegant Sasquatch has you covered from all angles. Their beard oils will make your whiskers as smooth as a buttery glide. Their balms will sculpt your beard into a masterpiece that would make Da Vinci jealous. Their butters will leave your beard softer than a cloud made of marshmallows, and their washes will quench your beard with a scent that's fresher than the waterfalls in the Rockies. My beard is ready for the bearded revolution. You can find the elegant Sasquatch on Instagram and Facebook. They're ready to share their hairy wisdom, showcase their bearded customers, and entertain you with memes that will make your mustache curl with laughter. <laughs> I can't wait to join the hairy community and bask in the glory of their bearded memes. So, folks, get ready to let your beards run wild. Unleash your outer beast and head over to Facebook and Instagram to find the elegant Sasquatch. Trust me, your beard will thank you, and you'll be the envy of every bearded creature in the virtual forest. Here's to smelling like a wild creature and embracing your inner Sasquatch. Cheers to that, my fellow bearded brethren, and stay elegant with the elegant Sasquatch. <sighs> All right, we're back, everybody. We are back at it, and uh, I'm not really sorry. I, I used to say sorry a lot for uh, pausing for a sponsorship, but I'm not sorry about it. You know, <laughs> sponsors are a good thing, and uh, I'm not saying they're not keeping the lights on or anything, but uh, you know, it, it's a good thing all around. Hopefully, as the I get to be a bigger show, maybe they'll pay for my private jet. Uh, I'll come visit Jesse here in uh, Canada, and all, all will be good, right? Or I'll fly him to my studio. But until then. Uh, here we are talking. So I'm talking with uh, Jesse Lewis out of Canada. He is a comedy hypnotist. He's a uh, he's a guy who's into a lot of different things, and uh, I think that uh, I think he and I should uh, should get weird on this in this half of the show. You know, what I mean, I like to uh, I like to get weird with people. I think that's when we really kind of like see who we are. Uh, I just promise that I won't get. Uh, I can't even promise that. I'll try not to get too strange, but. Um, you know, speaking of strange, I like I said, well, I do some paranormal investigation. I'm super into it. I mean, I'm into uh, the psychic realm of all of that. And I think my listeners are, too. I've had some different people. Uh, Dean McMurray, the military medium, is up there in uh, North Dakota. So he's not too far from you. And uh, well, I don't know where you are in Canada because I, I had have to look at a map because I, I honestly I could tell you every place in the United States, but I have absolutely no idea. Uh, where the heck you are where are you in Canada that's the first question I'm 400 miles north of North Dakota okay perfect so yeah you're like a straight a stone's up. throw away straight up <laughs> yep. have you been to the United States do you come here a lot uh I have a few times I've been to Vegas been a couple other places so yeah and cool drove through drove through and it was a lot of fun yeah 
what'd you think of uh what'd you think of us americans like I, when you deal with us I, i've always wonder like canadians what you guys think about us uh do you, do you guys think we're just a bunch of uh and it's okay to say you know <laughs> do you think we're just a bunch of so, fat, angry people like what do you think we are so i live um Okay, I don't want anything to come off as racist in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Where I live, we're very, very Caucasian. We okay. really are. We're we're basically like Montana. There's there's very few uh black people here. Yeah. And go to America, it was like, holy cow, it's like half the population, or maybe yeah. <laughs> maybe 30% of the population. Um up in Canada, our population is uh First Nations, so I guess Indian is what you guys call First Nations people still, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, or Aboriginal. Um, so we have like 20% uh, First Nations. Uh, and just the diversity that I saw of non-Caucasians, was, it was amazing because that still hasn't hit Canada where I am specifically. We're basically the North Dakota or the Montana of Canada, right? So right. we're not that diverse. Uh, we're very agrarian where I live. We have a lot of agriculture and we're not very urban. Uh, my territory is literally 1,500 miles, how far I travel for shows. Wow. So yeah, yeah I'm all over the place. Um, I mean, how did you have any, uh, did you have any African, uh, well, did you have any African descent black people in your uh, schools or anywhere? I mean, how how many would you say you knew growing up? I did not know a black person until I was 18 years old. Wow. Which is crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, still, some of my friends, I have friends in other areas because I'm an entertainer, right? So mm -hmm. you meet other entertainers and you become friends. And I've got people in Ontario, which is north of Michigan or whatever, that they're black and they're they're part of the culture out there. But that's in basically Toronto. So. Yeah it's a huge urban center. So of course there's that diversity. Um, and for, for lack of a better term, where I live was pretty racist until the last 20 or so years. Um, there weren't a lot of diverse cultures moving in uh, until the Caucasian people here quit having babies or their babies decided to move to the cities because there was no opportunity in these little towns, right? So how the heck did we get off this? <laughs> I don't know. This uh, is all. I know this is good though. This is what but, a podcast is all about. It's, yeah, this is okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I just found that the America was very diverse in in culture compared right. to where I'm at, and I guess that was a, a reflection of slavery and just the the black community being down there more than they were in Canada, right? Um, as far as I know, Saskatchewan actually only had one fully black settlement, Frenchman's Butte, um, about 300 kilometers north of me, where where black people settled. And it, it's crazy to think that because that community is not even really there anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's just, no, there, there's, it's okay. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is the great thing about communication with other human beings, you know, especially from other parts of the world is you know, where I'm starting to talk, I'm starting to talk to you about the psychics and paranormal, and we go into, <laughs> we go into yeah. black culture in Canada, but that's okay. You know, like I, I grew up um, with black friends everywhere. You know what I mean? Like I, I find them to be really? the culture and the people around, believe it or not. Yeah. Even in the Midwest here, uh, especially in Nebraska, there, there's, there's a lot, a lot of African-American people here. It's not as big as like in the South, but some of my best friends, some of those beautiful people I know are African-American, you know, so I, I, I do get it, though. I mean, don't take me wrong either. I don't want you guys canceling me. I don't want you to cancel Jesse here. Um, all I'm saying, I could see, I mean, they just have, they haven't had the culture around them. I'm not saying it's a, it's okay. I'm not saying racism's ever okay. But I am saying that, I, I mean, we all know that in, in rural areas, areas where there aren't uh, multicultural people, uh, people tend to be afraid of what they don't understand. So we can kind of just leave it at that. Um, but I, I do want the listener to know kind of like whereabouts you are in Canada. Um, you know, so my... I'm no, go ahead. I'm smack dab right in the middle. Um, pretty much Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba. It's north of Nebraska, uh, not Nebraska, uh, Montana and uh, north Dakota. 
uh, we're basically right north of that. And uh, basically over to the Rockies is, is where I go. And then, yeah, that's it. So like, um, so how, how big, a, you said it's kind of a rural area, right? Uh, or it's, it's pretty open. I shouldn't say rural, um, but it is in a way, I mean, what's the, uh, what's the terrain like there? I mean, for, for the geography, geography fans out there who have no idea about the terrain of where you live, is it flat like here in Nebraska? What's it like? Uh, the Canadian prairies is probably flatter than Nebraska. Oh, okay. We can, the horizon is flat for yeah. probably 500 miles where right. I live around me. There, there, the, the, the tall, there, there's no mountains uh, except one man-made one that they built out of a garbage dump. Uh, yeah. So, so realistically, we are flat, flat here, uh, and we, the demographics is basically farming. So we have all these little communities of 1,500 people or 2,000 people. And there's only about 10 communities that are bigger than that where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, and our largest city is like 250,000 people. And that's wow. considered a large city where I'm at. So, yeah. So on a, on a supernatural level, um, I, I would be, I would feel dumb if I didn't ask a couple of different questions. First off, do you guys have any like uh, Bigfoot like cryptids that you guys are scared of up there? Do you have anything that, uh, that, yeah, that people talked about, you know, cryptids being like, the Loch Ness Monster, like Bigfoot, like all of that stuff. What do they have in your area? So my area, we're looking at mainly Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, here, you have to go further north, but there's talk of the first culture, the, the Indian culture here has stories of for lack of a better term, I don't know the word in 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 Cree or Dene, but there's talk of uh, elvish creatures, kind of thing, like little oh, wow. green men in the woods or dressed green men in the woods, leprechauns, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, there's talk of uh, well, Wendigo uh, is up here, uh, and then of course, uh, skinwalkers, that thing, things like that. They talk about those things being here. Uh, on a personal note, I fully believe in some of those things uh, because I've experienced them. Uh, please elaborate. When, when we get there. So please elaborate. Okay. So this was from when I was a kid. Um, I used to fully believe that I could hear voices in the woods. Mm -hmm. Fully. Um, and, and that was probably when I was between four and 10. Now, are those the fancies of a kid or is it just maybe kid being more open to that? Right. right. Um, uh, I, on my grandpa's farm, there was, there's three stone that would have been too heavy to put. They were basically in the middle of the field there for where they were. No one could have put them there with the machinery that was available to my grandparents and stuff like that. So if you sit on those three stones, it's like an energy, if that makes any sense, where you feel displaced and it just doesn't feel right to sit there Yeah, more than like two or three minutes. Um, that that's the best way I can explain it. Um, and that's the same place where I would be able to hear those voices when I was a kid. I can't hear them now, probably because I've shut myself down to all that stuff. Right. But I do think that that there's something magical about that place. Um uh, my grandpa's farm, I took one of my friends there when I was about 25, and he'd been to China to to the temples and things like that. And I took him there and he said the 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 clearing where those stones are feels like being in one of the Chinese temples. It feels like it's holy in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I believe in, in a lot of those things still. That's a lot, man. I mean, that I, yeah. I love hearing that. I like, I, I, this is what my Lissy 
we've we've finally dug into it with you. You know, we we get comfortable with each other. You know, maybe I'm putting you in a trance right now a little bit, and uh, and here we are. We <laughs> or maybe you're doing it to me. I don't know, but yeah, we we're we're getting into it a little bit. I I have heard of the Wendigo. Um, yeah, the the small creatures that you you referred to. I know that that the same things have kind of been seen in like Ireland and different wooded uh, mm-hmm. wooded areas. And I I just don't think honestly, if you put a hundred people, we'll just say a hundred people for this lack of you know anything else. I don't think that everyone's nuts. I, I I just don't. I'm sorry. I don't think everyone's crazy. I think if they all tell that story, I think you have to add a certain. Um, certain variables to it but i think the people are telling the truth not everybody but a lot of people are just like with ghosts ghosts have been talked about for centuries i mean for throughout time uh you can go back to some of the earliest earliest you know tab tablet you know all that stuff where they're talking about stories of you know even on cave cave drawings things like that there's ghosts right there's spirits there's things that they don't understand so I don't think it's that far out there. I don't think people are just uh, all hopped up on LSD or hallucinating. Uh, you weren't hallucinating as a kid. So I I totally believe you. And I think kids do tap into that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, have you, have you experienced, uh, aside from that, like, have you experienced any ghosts of any sort? Like, have you ever lived in a haunting? So on grandpa's farm, and I wasn't the only one to see this. I remember my my siblings telling me about this but every once in a while we'd be able to watch a woman walking across the hill and you could see her plain as day um first nations woman in in full first nations garb for up here which is for winter and she would be walking across the hill um other than that i'm getting goosebumps talking about this It, it freaks me out a little bit because it brings up those memories um other than that we used to be able to smell things sometimes for instance my mom who's passed now she would smell blood and literally three or four days later someone would die wow Uh, that type of thing yeah um my dad he he's one of like six people in the world to survive this but he fell onto a sawmill when i was four years old onto the head saw where Uh the wood goes through so he fell onto that tough tough old bugger he picked his guts up drove into the hospital i was four years old and we hadn't received a phone call yet we were still on the old handheld phone attached to the wall rotary and i was telling my mom something's wrong with that something's wrong with that something's wrong with that and sure enough 45 minutes later we get a call from the hospital that he was had driven himself into the hospital he picked up his guts and drove himself into the hospital i was four years old and somehow i knew that it happened so how the hell does that work? I'm sorry for swearing. Yeah, I, I apologize. I no, no, you're no, um, you're fine. Um, I didn't mean to go on a tangent earlier about swearing. Trust me, I I do my my share of uh, sailor swearing. Um, <laughs> but that's still a question for for me, right? Like, yeah. how does that work? How does a child know know that happened? And it's happened to thousands of other people as well. It right. really happened. Not that specific instance, but knowing that something is wrong. Or being visited by somebody who just passed on. Yeah. I don't know how it works. Uh, When I talk to different mediums and different people, they all kind of tell me the same thing. That we all do, we can tap into all of these things on our own. If we're just open to it, if we, you know, if we we look at it a different way. And a lot of people look at that as tinfoil hat, kooky stuff. Oh, they're they're lying. They're full of it. But I don't think so. I think because, I mean, the ones that I've talked to, the, the things that they've said to me, some of them couldn't possibly know any of the things that they said right? and that and, and they weren't leading me in the direction i was actually trying to block them you know, mentally you know like like that was kind of my thing you know they're hence the boner killer thing again uh here's kane the boner killer for all meeting <laughs> mm-hmm. i was trying to block them and i couldn't like they they still kind of, they still got me and uh and so yeah it, it, the kind of the jury's out on that but i mean that that's a thank you for sharing those that story uh, and you know, those are really good stories. And that's the stuff that my listeners like. Um, something that I'm going to earn kudos for with my wife, who just recently began listening to my podcast, which is unbelievable. But uh, <laughs> hey, that's a win. It is a win. It's hard to get them to be interested in what they don't. They don't. She never once listened to podcasts, didn't even understand what they were. 
And I'm like, cool, I get it. That's why you don't listen. But she uh, she started listening. Um, her and I watch um, The Curse of Oak Island. I mean, do you guys, do you, have you watched The Curse of Oak Island? I haven't watched since the first season, but yeah. <laughs> I've been looking at the trailers for the newest one. Yeah. It looks pretty good now. Are you uh, are you into have you have you read about like the the Knights of Templar and all the all the deals that they're kind of I going? Have. So what what is what is a Canadian's perspective on all of that? I mean, do you think it's a bunch of hogwash? Do you think they're ever going to find anything? Is what I want to ask. I think that there's certain self fulfilling prophecies. Um, they had to lose one more person before they said they would find it, right? Yeah. So yeah. if it's there, they'll find it. If it's not, won't. Um, theoretically, everyone that had to have died for it is now dead, according to the curse, right? right. So maybe, maybe. And they are getting deeper than they've ever been before. Um, I don't know if the Templar Knights would, or it was the Templars that buried it? No. It was somebody else. It was pirates, right? Somebody else. Yeah, I, I think you know, there's been so many. Th the thing on that show yeah. that's uh, is they'll listen to any crackpot theory for TV purposes, right? So like, yeah. it's like, oh, here's another crackpot person who says, "I've got the case solved. I know exactly where it is." And then a couple episodes later, I'll be darned if we didn't find anything but like a metal nail, which is very cool. Don't get me wrong, I love history and all that. It's cool what they're finding, but at some point. When are they going to stop spending so much money on all this machinery or, or, or will they be what some of those people who take it to their death? You know, like they spend all of their family fortune. I think the answer to that is when the television show stops getting ratings enough to pay for yeah. the machinery. <laughs> well, eventually we're going to um, get tired of watching the same thing. We can only watch so many tubes of clay come up and them digging in the clay with nothing, you know, and just spelling out numbers. Are you sure? You well, yeah. Well, I'm probably wrong. I, I I say that, but I will watch it till the end. But I love the history that they talk about. I think for me, since you haven't watched mm -hmm. it, it, but you've watched enough of it, it's the uh, it's the the narrator guy is is completely annoying because every single show is he it narrates Jericho it. Show? Huh? Is it Chris Jericho narrating it? No, I don't think so. I don't. Who is it? Who is the narrator on the? Uh, I, it would be much more interesting. Get well, you, you just hit on something with me too. I mean, uh, you're you're Canadian. Do you watch wrestling at all? Do you dig wrestling? Well, actually, when you said I'm not, we're people aren't going to watch it, a stick for 25 years. I was about to say we've been oh. watching Raw and SmackDown, <laughs> yeah, <so> <laughs> and we still do. So, yeah, and it's the same stuff over and over and over again. So it went um, over my dumb monkey I brain. Think <laughs> <laughs> you switched right by me it, it's a dopamine thing it, it really is it's it's shut your brain off for a little while get hypnotized by it and 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 go forth right yeah. so yeah I, I think people will watch it until it's like ancient aliens what proof of that is there well very little if you actually look at it but people right. watch that show all the time and who's to say they're wrong i'm not going to say that the old island people are wrong in any way shape or form what i will say is if they're right then everything they need is there to find the if it's there so it looks yeah. like an important it's what's interesting is it's a, like an important piece of canadian history right they're bringing up all this stuff they're bringing up uh, historical uh, artifacts they're they're figuring this this they're piecing this puzzle together that never was so at the very least i think that you know kudos to them for the show i mean it's on the right channel of course you know and it's it's they're they're giving the history and i'm all for that me if you're asking me, you know, yes, I might get bored with some of the aspects of it, but trust me, the historical aspect will always reel me in. I would sit down and drone over the old, you know, like history channel where it was just like documentary style, like when we're in school, I can watch that stuff for, you know, 24 hours a day and be happy. So, um, you know, wrestling, wrestling's another thing like you talked about. It is a dopamine thing. Um, it, but it's just like, I don't know, for me, wrestling, um, you know, since we hit on it, wrestling's nostalgia and wrestling's my childhood and so and and i know wrestling's huge in canada i mean there's some massive wrestling leagues in canada there there's some of the biggest wrestlers that we've ever seen have come from canada do you have any brushes with uh with any of these big wrestlers or who are your favorites so favorites 
we'll get to that, but brushes with them. I was actually part of BEW wrestling. They're basically okay. like 50 miles from me. Claude, big shout out to you. Uh, but I trained to wrestle for about three months. Okay. Awesome. And I, that was when I was like 32. So I was old and fat already. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, it didn't last long because my body can't hold up. But wrestling, absolutely. Favorites? There is only one greatest of all time. There is. It's not who you expect. It's it's Mick Foley. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. He defined who the weirdos, the the, the freaks. He defined the freaks uh, in in society in general. When he was playing mankind, when he was doing Cactus Jack, and even Dude Love, the man who he wanted to be, but also and watched him aspire to be because we knew we couldn't be the Shawn Michaels. We knew we couldn't be the Triple H. We knew we couldn't be the big muscle bound dudes, but hell, I can be a fat guy. That's kind of cool. That's funny as hell. And I'm okay with that. Right. Um, yeah. And that's why fully by far and Undertaker's my second favorite because he was that paranormal guy uh, and it worked good. Um, yeah. And well, who takes a beating like that? Him? I mean, think about the hell in the cell with, uh, with the Undertaker, the two people you mentioned, with Undertaker and Mick Foley, yep. what happened on the, the the that particular night? You know that that really just where that that set the WWE apart from W's everywhere, everyone. You know that's when they took over. Honestly, if you ask me, that was there's a lot of things that changed, but when Mick Foley lived <laughs> to tell the tale, Mick Foley was thrown. You know, yep. almost missed the table, almost missed the spot. Could have could have been a lot worse. You know, got knocked out, you know, during the match, still got up, kept getting up, still wanted to do the tack thing. I mean, Mick Foley is the best. And if you ask me, yep. his uh, dude love is my favorite character uh, of him the, because I love Cactus Jack. I love all of that. But dude love was just a cool kind of like a uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost like an anti hero in a way, but it's just like a guy you love, too all in the same. So yeah, man, uh, Mick Foley, for sure. He's definitely on the rip Mount Rushmore. Yep. It's because he's the guy that we could all be, we could all aspire to be cool, but we probably weren't going to be cool. And I knew I was never going to be in the shape of of the rock or triple H or anything like that. So I knew that was never going to happen, but I could see myself in Foley. I I really could. And he was genuinely a nice guy. He, He wasn't a jerk to people. He, there's very few wrestlers that have anything bad to say about Foley, which is which is amazing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he uh, he survived it all, and you know he he gave his entire blood, true blood, sweat, tears, part of an ear to the business. So uh, yep. kudos to him, and uh, yeah, you know I I definitely agree with you. Um, I really hope that eventually down the line, you and I can have a part two on this so that we can touch base more because i think that you and i could probably get into a lot of things but um i would be i'd be blowing it for you uh and i know i probably don't have a lot of listeners in canada yet but um i i want to give you the opportunity to all the listeners if you have something you'd like to promote or anything like that a website all of that stuff please do right now if you if you'd like to websites hypnotist and unfortunately I can't get a U.S. visa because I'm not famous and you have to be famous to get a visa. So make me famous and I'll get a visa. And I'll be glad to do shows down there. Uh, HypnotistJessieLewis.com. Um, I also do hypnotherapy, okay. which is at SuperiorSuccessSecrets.com. Uh, I work for stop smoking, weight loss, all those types of things. And it's really an effective thing. So feel free to visit me there. Um, yeah, that's it. This went really, really fast, didn't it? It did. It, it goes fast. I would love to talk more. I just don't, you know, I kind of, I, I, sometimes I push these things to the max, you know, and then your, your audience, uh, <laughs> your audience after say 45 minutes to an hour and a half, they're like, so I think, you know, I, I mean, I won't, buy, I'll definitely talk to you more, but I would love to have you on again sometime, you know, as our, uh, you know, our resident, um, you know, hypnotist talk to you about some things. I'd love to have you on again. I think that you're going to come across great to the listener, uh, you guys out there who are watching at home. Uh, I think you guys are nodding your heads right now going, yes, uh, we, we do love it. Um, so man, I just thank you so much for being on the show. 
uh, and explaining to us a little bit about hypnosis um, that you're not you're not all a bunch of evil uh, mad hatter types uh, you're actually you're actually nice guys like yourself and uh you know i just I hope, hope so. to talk to you soon man awesome do you want to do a demonstration before we end off yeah well, well yes of course i i, I don't want to end it awesome. with something go ahead okay so I always try to do a little bit of a demonstration. So what I'm going to get you to do, Kane, you're the only one in front of me. I want you to do this, okay? Go ahead. Okay. I'm going to make you follow along. All right. I want you to do that. You got your hands up? Put your hands up, like. Yeah. Now, this technically isn't hypnosis. It is, it's a reaction of your body. I want you to look right at your index fingers, not at anything else. I want you to imagine an elastic band wrapped around those index fingers. And anybody at home, you can follow along. On the count of three, I want you to pull your index fingers, not your palms, but your index fingers apart about one inch, okay? On the count of three. But imagine an elastic band there, okay? Anybody at home that wants to follow along, you can feel free to do this. Keep those palms squeezed together like you're crushing the head of your enemy. That's right. Look at your index fingers. Imagine an elastic band. I want you to pull them about one inch on the count of three. One, two, three. Just the index finger, just like that. And I want you to imagine, pull your index fingers apart. That's right. Imagine that elastic band getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the more you resist, the stronger and tighter it gets. Hmm. It's a weird thing. Are you able to pull them apart at all? I'm, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm trying to now. fight this thing. Wow. You can put your hands down now. Okay. Yeah. Now, you, you had two choices. Now, this isn't actually hypnosis. It's an automatic body response. Yeah. So if your hands went like that and you're in the audience and your fingers started to pull together, welcome to hypnosis. Yeah. That's really what hypnosis feels like. You, you can fight it if you want to. And don't worry. I didn't do anything weird, obviously. But you can fight it if you want to. But if you truly took part and you, you wanted to do this, your fingers would have came together and almost touched. And that's just a sign that you were following directions. It's really nothing more than that. Yeah. But it is exactly how hypnosis feels. Wow. It's weird I, that a person's wor words can affect our body in that way. Um, right. There's a bunch of other things I'd love to do. Next time I'm on, maybe we'll go through two or three of them uh, if you choose to have me. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's it. And I, I, I can just say before we wrap it up is, I mean, I could feel my, I could feel my fingers coming back together as if it was as if the elastic band was pulling them back together. It was, it was such, it's so strange. It just, it just proves that uh, you could probably talk me and get me to do about anything. So, well, thank you for that demonstration. Next time we're going to build this thing up next time. People are going to be ready for this and we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to see what we can get to happen. So thank you so much, Jesse. I appreciate your time. Uh, look out for Jesse Lewis, the hypnosis, if uh, if no excuse me, hypnotist. There we go. There's a word that we could use. Uh, <laughs> if you're in the Canada, um, you know, anywhere in Canada, really uh, look out for him, go see him in, in those areas. And uh, thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care.